Hi everyone, welcome to chapter three in Rigid Body Physics Path to Mastery, the deep dive series where I share my journey learning Blender with the community. So far in chapter one and two, we have covered the fundamentals of using Blender Rigid Body Simulations. We go even deeper in this chapter by working with the Cell Fracture add-on. Rather than step through the add-on, I will link my favorite tutorials and instead show you how I implemented this mug smashing in my animation. We investigate the issues with smaller simulations and look at how to scale them up and retime them for the best results. I'll do a full worked example for the smashed cup to show the process involved and gotchas to avoid. This method is quite involved and I'm sure there are different approaches. Let me know how you'd tackle the challenge. Finally, I'll comment on the fraction modifier. I'm your host Power8D, we'll jump straight into it. I'm now going into a full worked example to show how to shatter the cup and switch out with the original object. The reason we switch out the objects is so that the fracture lines aren't visible in the original setup until the point of impact. However, if this is an issue for you, there is a much simpler approach, which I'll go over after the main example. Now we delete everything in the scene, and then we'll append the cup model that we downloaded. And then under object coffee cup, we need to scale that up because it's too small for a rigid body. I decided to investigate my assumption about smaller objects, and this is my findings. As expected, the larger cube of 2 meters performed very well, and the small of 0.05 meters moves in a very erratic fashion. If it's not too small, say the 0.125 meters, we can increase steps per second to try and compensate. However, the best option is still to use a larger object size. It seems to be a myth out there that the object mass will overcome this floating behavior. However, for my testing it does not. I'm not saying mass isn't important, it's very important for each object's interaction for the different sizes, so you should always calculate that. I skipped the step of applying a scale correction factor to the smash cup, so I'll cover it here. The reason we care about this, or it might be an issue, is because it starts to have a floating or a slow motion quality to its falling, and that's because the objects are so large. This is a pretty confusing topic, I'll do my best to explain it, and please feel free to add your own corrections and tips in the comments section. It's true the larger the object scale, the more accurate our simulation becomes, however it starts to have a floating effect, simply because of our distance and gravity. We can overcome this to an extent by applying a correction factor to the rigid body speed setting. We can blindly adjust the speed until it looks about right, However, looking at our equation for acceleration, the time factor is squared, which means if we want to bring our simulation down by a factor of 10, it's the square root of 10, so 3.16 in this case. So we'll start there and see how that looks. So once that's baked out, it looks much more like a small stack of cubes rather than a ginormous tower that's slowly falling. And we can double check how fast it's falling. You can see that our at frame 10, it's moved to 4.6 meters, so that's about right. Uh, because once we scale it down by 10, that 4.6 is going to be 0 0.46 meters at frame 10. You can see that they've scaled down nicely. So we're aiming for a target of 0 0.2 meters or 20 centimeters, which is much more human scale the cubes rather than two meters. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the original two meter and then the scaled down with the speed correction factor applied to it to 0 0.2 meters. I thought to myself why not just use a unit scale and model things much smaller but if you look at the blender manual on the rigid body world it actually comments on this user interface and not how things behave internally. For example, physics simulations don't take this unit scale into account. So I ran through an example and we can see that uh, my two millimeter cubes just act as if they are the two meter cubes with the 0 0.001 unit scale. I've set it to millimeters and grams, of course. Interestingly, when the unit scale is changed, the scene gravity is automatically updated. Here are the two approaches side by side, first with rigid body speed set to 1, and then with the correction factor applied. You can see that it gives the same results. Remember that these scaling issues are only important if we're trying to bring up a microscopic sized simulation to a larger proportion so that the bullet software can calculate a better result for us. I thought of overcoming the issue by applying the 10 factor to gravity to see what happened. 
it certainly moved a lot faster as if it was smaller cubes. However, the greater gravity pushed the cubes through the floor in quite an unex unexpected way. And the cube stacking was far worse. So I don't really like this method. I quickly set up the cup scene again using the scene unit scale of 0 0.1 and rigid body speed of 3.16 for our 10 scale factor. You can see that it looks quite different and it seems to almost move too fast. However, on checking my distance equations using gravity, the distance seems about right. If we add our references back into the scene, it gives it a bit more context. These blocks represent roughly human scale and inside a little building here. I'm really happy with how it compares to the real test. I think it might just need some motion blur to make it look more real. After all that, I've concluded there are two workflows. Either scale up your object at the start or use the unit scale approach. I suggest if it's simply a scene for the rigid body using the unit scale approach because it's more intuitive. However, if we bring it back into a different scaled scene, or a scene with a scale of one, then both approaches are going to have to be rescaled anyway. So just pick your favorite. And a quick tip is, I've noticed that when I'm up close to an object, it looks like it's falling way too fast. So it's useful to have some references for the scaling. So these represent my people and I've got a little house over here. So we can get a bit more of a bearing of how it's meant to be falling. And you see that that looks quite good. I'm going to continue with my cup example where I use the scale up original object and then scale back down at the end method. And we'll add in a ground plane. And we'll just duplicate this up for our table. Move it to the side. Don't need that anymore. This will be our table, so we'll scale that down a little. Nice close to the edge. And we'll make these rigid body passive and the cup can be active. And we're going to make a collider now. We use this to push the cup off. So we'll keyframe from there to there. If we play back our simulation, we'll see that it passes straight through, and that's because of the animated property. So we'll enable that. Now it pushes the cup off. And that's because we haven't applied the scale, so that fixes it up nicely. Position this to catch the cup. And we'll just play with this until we get a speed and a fall that we like. So that looks pretty nice. Turn up auto keyframing. And we'll just create a collection to hold our colliders and make them unselectables. And I'll just enable random colors so that everything's easy to see. Um, let's tidy up our timeline for about 100 frames. And we'll set the cache to the same. And we want to bake the cache here and bake the keyframes. So we're going to find the transition point where we're going to swap out a fractured model for the solid model. So it looks to be the last frame of the solid cup here. And the next frame will be when we want the fractured cup to show up. Just press M and we'll put a marker there for our reference. So let's go ahead and delete these keyframes. And just hide it under the table. Go ahead and self fracture the object now. And this is very important that we set material of the internal faces to material slot one. That'll save us in shading later on. Add it to a new collection as well. That's very handy. We have the original and our fractured object here, and it's all in a collection. We'll make our original cup unselectable for the time being. Choose a piece to make my active object, so I've made this one it. You pretty much have to do it the exact order that I do this, and uh, it's super tedious, so I've made a little add-on that helps with some of the steps, so I'll point that out. Starting from now until I say the add-on will take care of, um, but the manual method is rigid body, and we want it to be active, and we want it to be animated. And then we need to copy this to all the other objects. Then we need to link that animation data. And then we need to unlink the animation data.
And those are all the steps that my free add-on will take care of. So I'll go back and just show you with the add-on, find the exact keyframe we want the uh, physics to kick in. We need to put it on 30, frame 30. So physics tab, keyframe animated property. And you can see it's added the active object and keyframe bell animated property for all of the objects there. So that's what I recommend. I'll do the link in the video description to my Gumroad page. We can insert $0 for the price and click I want this. To install the add-on, go to Edit, Preferences, Add-ons, Install, browse to your download location and double click on the file. Click the checkbox and drop it down so that we can see some hints on how to use the add-on and where it's located. Click Remove to uninstall the add-on. Open the end panel and you can find it under Physics, Keyframe Rigid Body Physics. The power in this add-on is that we can select multiple objects and keyframe them at once for the animated property. So select your frame, click new keyframes, and they're all set. Run the simulation, and you can see that they become active rigid bodies on frame 10. We can then really quickly just select the other objects and keyframe them at different intervals that we like. If the keyframe property already exists, the add-on will throw a warning and we can see the objects that were skipped in the system console. I've provided the overwrite keyframes button so that it will delete and reposition those keyframes for us. And of course, it's really easy just to jump in at any point during an object's animation, insert the animated property, and that'll just kick it over to the rigid body simulation from the animation system, just like this. And now we need to insert uh, the location rotation here to match our cup, and we're going to follow the tra trajectory up. And this is going to give us initial velocity for our rigid body, so it's very accurate. Our fractured cup goes from here to here, and it's going to follow that momentum into the rigid body physics when we smash it on the ground. So let's try it out. Doesn't work. That is because we haven't freed the bake. That's caught me out quite a lot today. And then we might have to update the objects. So that's working well now. This is the old problem of objects falling through the floor. Very easy fix. We can just thicken up that plane, make it a solid object. If we rerun the sim, that's very good now. Uh, that's pretty much it for the simulation. Uh, go ahead and bake that, and we'll also bake the animation, the keyframes. Just makes everything so much easier to work with. We don't want this initial keyframe, so we'll delete that now. That's it for the physics simulation, but the following steps of uh, toggling visibility and assigning materials is a little tedious, so I'll just run through it as well. Our original cup, we're going to hide under the plane, so we've already done that. And in this cup, do the same thing. We're going to bring it into the world on this frame. So the previous frame, we're going to have to hide it under the ground. And we don't need the previous frame. All right, so it pops up. Up swap position. And it looks like that one is smashed. Whereas the original sits down here. So if we play from the start. That's working well. Um, so we'll do some materials. I don't like this. Uh, material that came with our cup, so I'm just going to delete that and make my own. And we'll select the collection with the shortcut Shift-G, and we'll use the Control-L to link the materials. And we're going to need to apply that same material to our original. And because we applied the internal surfaces to material slot 1 in our cell fracture, we can easily apply a material to these internal faces. And so this is material slot zero. This is material slot one. Go ahead and make a new slot, a new material, I mean. And then we'll want to apply that to the rest again. And let's just hide our collider here. And that's it. I will briefly go over the fast method for fracturing the object. And now the reason you wouldn't want to do this is because it doesn't swap out with the original model, which means the fracture lines will be clearly visible. So self fracture the object as before, select all of the shards and add as rigid body active, and we can run the simulation and it just works.
we want to use collision shape convex hull because it wraps around the mesh tightly and doesn't cause collision mesh intersection explosions. Using my keyframe animated property add-on, we can give it some initial velocity. We can apply a fixed constraint. This gives each shard a bonding strength that we can break apart. Remember to alt-click breakable so that it applies it to all the selected objects, or empties in this case, and adjust the threshold until it's shattering in a manner that you like. Fantastic, now we have our simulation baked out and ready to be imported into a scene which we would like to use it. However, this cup is a media tall, which is just so unrealistic, and we'll need to bring it back down to real-world scale. I'll show you how to do that. If we select all of them and just scale by 0.1, it's 0.1 because we initially scaled it by 10 at the start of the video. And let's see what happens here. The cup hasn't scaled correctly and the planes have. So what's going on there? We'll just backtrack and bring up the end panel and see we have keyframes on the scale for the cup. So we actually have to clean those channels. They so select everything, plot the graph editor. And we'll search for scale. Click in here, A, X, and we delete those. Now we can scale a lot. Point one again, and play that back. But what's happened now is its animation data is still for the full scale. So we also have to scale down the animation data. Don't worry, it's really easy. So everything's selected. I'm going to search for location. Click here, select all, scale, Y, point one again. And that's how we can bring it back down to real world scales to use in our scene. I've written a script to automate this process. So I'll show you once again with the script. Pull up a new window, change it to the text editor, and open the downloaded script from Gumroad. I put mine on desktop, double click on it, and now select all the objects and hit run script. And it's done for us. This script is in an early stage, so use with extreme caution. A really quick and dirty way to scale our animation is to simply link it to another blend file. We can then scale the entire animation. However, this makes it extremely difficult to retime and work with. I'm not going to do an in-depth detail about how to use the self fracture add-on because there's so much quality content out there already. So I'm just going to link some of my favorites. I love Blender Secret's little quick tips on how to use the uh, cell fracture. So we go into his videos and you just search for fracture here. Blender HD has this good example about overcoming some issues and debugging the tool. It talks about how the mesh has to be a manifold. With Suzanne, we have to close the eye socket. I do like Mr. Cheeves' example by using a uh, rigid body constraint fix to hold the wall together. And then the collision object breaks the bonds. He also uses the annotate tool to draw on the fracture lines, which I really like that feature as well. There is a far superior tool to self fracture add on, and that's the fracture modifier made by Blender Physics. However, it's not available for Blender 2.8, it was Blender 2.79, but you can see how it smashes only the impact area and not the entire object. It's got these uh, volumetrics. And it also has particle effects, so it's really powerful stuff. You can get a version for Blender 2.8. It's a branch, and I've heard that it's quite unstable, but it's there if you want to have a play with it. Well, that brings this chapter to an end. Feel free to leave a comment or suggestion and let me know how this series has helped you out. Reach out on Twitter and Instagram at Pair8D and show me your physics creations. Thank you so much for dropping by, and I'll catch you next time. You wanted me.